Well, by the time, oh, I had to make sure they were ready to go. Where are you going? Uh, uh, by the time he finishes. He uh, lives not far from here and uh, was raised in this area. His home has been for some years up here in Stanton, Virginia. That's spelled S-T-A-U-N-T-O-N, which us Yankees call Staunton, but they say Stanton. So don't ever let them correct you. You know that it's Stanton, and uh, even the um, Statler brothers will say that on their TV show, which is their home too, as you know. I call Eustace one of the premier researchers in his field, which is this field of, of freedom and what's happening to it, what we might be able to do about it, what we can do about it to regain or retain the freedoms that we have, the few freedoms we've got left. We've become increasingly aware of that, of course, in the last few years. Realizing that if we don't retain these and possibly regain some, it won't be long before we'll be allowed to have a conference like this. Because I've described you people to many of my speakers when I make, issue them invitation as saying you're the finest group of mentally active, politically incorrect people that <laughs> live in this part of the country. Eustace will tell us the latest, the title uh, that he gave me several months ago is the inside report on Hillary's health care plan, but he has carte blanche to speak on whatever he thinks are the, the most important topics that are appropriate for this time, this day, and this hour. And as you know, th things are changing very rapidly by the hour. I certainly, if you are not familiar with his life story, recommend that you pick up a copy of his book, A Writ for Martyrs, which tells of the dues he has paid in order to get where he is right now, and the things that have happened to him, and the things that have been done to him, which are, as usual, kind of incredible, but he's come through it in great shape, and now he's able to share a lot of things with us. Now, he's written a number of books. He'll have them with him, and he'll be here the, throughout the con conference, and he'll be giving a work, offering a workshop as well, where you can get three more hours of his research and wisdom. I know you're happy tonight to introduce our two welcome with a marsh, nice round of applause for Eustace Mullins, please. Thank you. This is sort of a historic occasion because I haven't spoken in Virginia for a number of years. And the reason that I have not been speaking in Virginia, not only because I'm quite unpopular in my hometown of Stanton because of my exposés of Woodrow Wilson, uh, who was born there, uh, I have pointed out that Woodrow Wilson gave us uh, the income tax, the Federal Reserve System, and World War I. And I don't know anyone else has done as much for his country as Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> well, that didn't make me too popular in Stanton because that's the only attraction they have. And uh, so I don't do much speaking around there. I stay out of sight. And I haven't spoken much in Virginia because I finally realized during my researches that the post-Civil War era, era, the uh, Reconstruction era, in Virginia had never ended. We still had this government in Richmond of carpetbaggers and scalawags, and uh, I just felt that I would not do much business in the state of Virginia as long as these scoundrels were here. Well, we had quite a revolution at the last election here recently, and an upstart named George Allen went in with no money and no support, and he beat the system. He beat the Reconstruction government that we had in Virginia, the machine. And now he's governor and things have changed, so um, uh, this is my first time to celebrate that here in Virginia. Because... Um, this is, as you know, a very historic era, uh, area here, Yorktown and Jamestown. But my ancestor, oddly enough, the first Mullins to come here actually landed at Plymouth, up in Boston. But he died the first winter, and I think the other Mullins has decided to go south. And, uh, but uh, William Mullins did, by the way, um, 
the grant of land that he had uh, encompassed the entire city of Boston. And I was up there last year, and it was kind of nice to see the old family holdings. <laughs> he, and I wish we still owned it, but we don't. But uh, Boston is a nice area. I like it. And uh, the fact that William didn't last long, uh, the rest of us have managed to survive, and I guess that's good. But I'm, I'm here this evening to talk to you about the Hillary's health care reform, which, like the Federal Reserve System, which it emulates, the Federal Reserve System is not federal, has no reserves, and it's not a system, it's a criminal syndicate. And the health care reform is composed of uh, people who really don't know that much about health. Secondly, they don't care. And third, of course, it's not a reform, it's part of the world order to take over another one-seventh of the entire economy of the United States, 14% of the entire GNP, they're going to lock it up under the bureaucracy and keep it there forever. And of course, health is a matter which uh, uh, we all are not concerned about enough. I didn't for many years. I wrote my books about the Federal Reserve System and the World Order and a writ for martyrs, and all this time I didn't pay any attention to health. Fortunately, I enjoyed pretty good health and stayed busy all the time. But I finally realized that the same John D. Rockefeller who sent his emissaries down here to Jekyll Island, Georgia to write the Federal Reserve Act for the Rothschilds of London. In 1907, John D. Rockefeller really took over the health care system of the United States. He launched a scheme to reform the medical schools of the entire United States, and he switched this country from homeopathic and naturopathic medicine under which the, the American people had been the healthiest and most productive people in the world. He switched us to the German system of allopathic medicine, which relies on a heavy use of drugs, radical surgery, and extended uh, periods of treatment in hospital and at home. And of course, this change has been very deleterious to us. And uh, I have seen some bumper stickers recently, and I'd like to get some myself, uh, saying Hillary's health care reform bill is dangerous to your health. And that's not an exaggeration. This thing will be more dangerous to your health than anything you've ever run into yet. Essentially, it's part of the world order plan to extend the bureaucracy. I think they intend to, uh, already on the books are 18 new federal agencies which will be implementing this plan, and they will have very drastic powers. First of all, it will criminalize the entire medical care system. Um, and uh, the penalties are not mild. Now this follows the pattern which was set by the Federal Reserve Act in 1913 when Congress passed it because with it they passed the 16th Amendment, the Income Tax Amendment, and they criminalized the collection of taxes. Now up to that time, if you owed some taxes on your property or something, they'd, they'd sell it, they'd evict you and sell it, but you didn't go to jail. Suddenly, income taxes, uh, anything to do with income tax became a criminal offense, and as you know, many Americans today are serving prison sentences because they didn't fill out their forms the way the government thinks they should. And of course there are answers to that too, as Dan Pilla has pointed out to you. And I had a few run-ins with the uh, Internal Revenue myself. I have a cha two chapters in my book, The Rape of Justice, about how to handle the, uh, the boys from the IRS. And um, in fact, a few years ago, I got uh, a letter from the uh, IRS agent in Stanton ordering me to report for an audit. Well, I read this over and I thought to myself, well, I'm terrorized by this. I mean, this is terrible. So uh, because I was terrorized, I filed a suit against the agent for $350,000 for terrorism. <laughs> If I'm terrified, I'm not ashamed to admit it. And uh, so I went right into court and said I was terrified. Well, the court didn't want to hear this. They bounced it around. 
They transferred it from state court to federal court. I tried to remand it to state court, and we kicked that around for about eight months. And finally, they uh, got it dismissed by the federal judge without any hearing, although I filed 39 motions, including eight motions to halt all collection of income taxes in the United States because I had raised points in this uh, uh, lawsuit that um, uh, it was illegal to collect uh, tribute for foreign potentates and princes. And I felt that until we resolved this and argued in court, there's no reason for them to keep on collecting taxes from all of you. They could suspend the whole thing until we thrash out these vital issues. Well, the government didn't see it that way. They wanted to keep that money coming in. And so finally they did disallow it. Then they came after me for back taxes, deficiencies. And of course, I went right into tax court. Although all of the good patriots had always said, never go into tax court. It's, uh, you won't get a fair shake. Well, you don't get a fair shake in any court in the United States. I mean, if they're going to talk you out of going into court, uh, you may as well never go into any court. You've got to go in and fight your way in and claw your way in and stay there as long as you can. It's like a lifeboat that they're trying to kick you out of and you're hanging on by your fingernails. That's what the legal process is in the United States. And if you think it's anything else, if you think it has anything to do with justice, if you think it has anything to do with fair play, if you think it has anything to do with your inherent rights as an American citizen, forget it. You go in there to struggle and to survive, and uh, from that point of view, you have a very good chance of doing it. And of course, if you represent yourself. I had a, a friend named Tom Donahue out in Dallas who's uh, been indicted on 57 counts. And after having known me for 10 years, he goes and hires a lawyer. So, of course, the lawyer uh, wanted him to plea bargain because lawyers, like anybody else, if they can get paid for work that they don't do, uh, it's great. So, uh, the lawyer, Tom then realized, he started to backpedal out of this situation, and uh, now he's representing himself, and of course, he refused the plea bargain which upset the IRS quite a bit because uh, they get everything set up uh, the way they want it, and then one of you patriots comes along and spoils it. And they're getting tired of that, but they can't do a whole lot about it because we're learning more every day. We're learning how to use our knowledge, go into court, fight them. And um, so this is what I did with the tax court. I went down to Richmond, Virginia, into the tax court, and... Uh, uh, we had a judge there, and I had already filed a lot of stipulations that um, the IRS was guilty of conspiring against me because they tried to have me put in a mental institution with the FBI. And uh, actually, the FBI and the IRS are not supposed to work together, but they did collude in my case. And I got the documentation because I got my FBI file, which I got after an extended struggle of two years. And... Um, so, uh, and at first I didn't even want to file because I said they couldn't have anything on me. I've never been arrested in my life, never really belonged to any political party. And in fact, I don't think I'd even voted at that time because I'd been traveling around the country, living in various places, and I never got interested in uh, local politics. So the FBI informed me they had 800 pages on me, which is four times the file on John Dillinger. <laughs> so... Uh, I really was quite flattered by this, <laughs> and of course I wanted it. And they said, well, you can have this file if you can prove to us that you're really Eustace Mullins. Well, they had kept me under surveillance, daily surveillance, for 33 years, and they still didn't know who I was. So that shows that <laughs> the FBI is not quite as efficient as you might think. Another 10 years, and they might really have been able to find out this guy is really Eustace Mullins. So anyway. I had to get a notarized statement that I was Eustace Mullins. So then I waited for the file to come, and it did not come. And um, so they stalled me for two years. And uh, finally, I, I knew uh, I had gone to college with a Senator Warner from Virginia here, John Warner. So I sent John Warner a little note, and I said, the FBI uh, had agreed to send me my file two years ago, and I'm still waiting. Well, he called them up, apparently, and they, I got it in two days. In there were 40 pages of memoranda where they had conspired to put me in a mental institution in 1959. I knew nothing about it. And um, so, of course, I filed suit against them on that. And I, in this IRS case, I brought that in because I had the documentation 
that the IRS had engaged in a criminal conspiracy to have me put in uh, a mental institution, the FBI and the IRS worked together. I sent these stipulations to the tax court judge so when I went down there, I was looking forward to thrashing all this out, you see. It was very embarrassing for them. In fact, when I got there, it was so embarrassing for them, the IRS did not even send anyone to represent them at my tax hearing. And instead, the judge said, I want you, I said, Your Honor, I have these stipulations here about uh, this conspiracy against me. He said, now, Mr. Mullins, we don't have time to go into anything like that. Now, if I had owed 18 cents on my returns, they could have spent six months thrashing it out in court, but they had no time to discuss any of my stipulations. And he said, I want you to go in with this U.S. attorney, and we went into a room, and the U.S. attorney admitted that I had no tax deficiency, and we came out, and we, the judge said, have you reached an agreement? And we said yes. And before I left that courtroom, the judge gave me a letter that I had no tax deficiency. I reproduced the letter in my Rape of Justice and also in the Writ for Martyrs. And uh, that was in 1981, and I've never heard from them since. In fact, I've been waiting to hear because I have a lot of new things that I want to try out. <laughs> and, uh, but they never call. So I think that is the way to beat them, is to be prepared to be able to go into court and let them know that you are not no longer terrorized, but that you're looking forward to a, some give and take and getting in there and uh, getting these things resolved. So the, uh, my first book was written on the Federal Reserve System. And of course, I have been in this now since 1942 when I went into the Air Force. And uh, when I got out, of the Air Force, I thought I was returning to civilian life, and I really had no political uh, activities or interests at that time. I was going to write the great American novel, like Hemingway, and retire to the south of France, and live the good life, become a connoisseur of wine, and so forth. Well, it's a good thing it never happened, because I'd be dead, my liver would be gone long ago. <laughs> so uh, Providence stepped in to save me from this fee uh, fate, and. Uh, I met a political prisoner named Ezra Pound. And Ezra Pound, as he'd, he was held for 13 and a half years without trial, never had a trial. I finally got him released. And uh, I was amazed to read in a magazine the other day, a little magazine that, uh, that I read for information called The Nation, which is the last Stalinist weekly magazine in the country. And in this uh, magazine, there was an article saying that James Jesus Angleton, the famous CIA agent, uh, had been the one who had sprung Ezra Pound from St. Elizabeth's Hospital. Well, this was news to me, and I, th I guess to everyone else. I don't know where this uh, writer had gotten this idea. I guess because Angleton had had a brief association with, with Pound uh, when he was a student at Yale University, and he had a little poetry magazine there. But I do know that Angleton never had visited Ezra Pound during his stay at St. Elizabeth's, 13 and a half years, and that he played no role whatsoever in this uh, release. So when I met Ezra Pound out there at the hospital, uh, he said to me, would you go to the Library of Congress and look up the Federal Reserve System, which I did. And uh, I came back and told him some of the things I found. He said, well, we'll write this as a detective story. So he commissioned me to write the book which appeared as Mullins on the Federal Reserve in 1952 and has been in print ever since. And he um, also edited it. The only book, as far uh, except one with his own name on it, that uh, he actually commissioned and edited himself. And you know, four of Ezra Pound's protégés were awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. That was T.S. Eliot, Ernest Hemingway, uh, James Joyce, and William Butler Yeats. And of course, all these writers are taught in our colleges every day, and they do teach some of Ezra Pound's works also. But uh, I now am the last living protege of Ezra Pound. All the others are long gone. They took their Nobel Prizes to the cemetery with them, and I haven't gotten mine yet. But, uh, and I doubt if I'll get it as long as I stay on this particular uh, 
frame of reference, but this is where I am and this is where I'm going to stay. But uh, what I found out about the Federal Reserve System, and uh, this is so important in understanding the Hillary health care reform bill, because they're doing it again, they're doing it exactly the same way as they got the Federal Reserve Act uh, through Congress in 1913. First, they had the secret meeting of the top insiders, the Rockefellers, the Morgans, the Rothschilds, and their representatives down at Jekyll Island, Georgia. Second, to get it through Congress, they ran a double play. First, they presented the Federal Reserve Act as a Wall Street banker's bill called the Aldrich Plan, and all of the big bankers came out and said, this is the plan that we want. And uh, of course, the people throughout the United States said, we don't want that plan because that's the banker's plan. So then Woodrow Wilson said, well, we're going to give the Democratic Party, which he was head at that time, we will give you a people's plan and we're going to call it the Federal Reserve Act. And on, as no one pointed out at the time, they were exactly the same bill. So now Hillary comes along with a um, health reform bill, which, uh, as I exposed almost a year ago, was originated at a secret meeting in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, which is native Rockefeller territory. John D. Rockefeller bought the whole area in 1924. And, uh, they had these secret meetings of the Jackson Hole group there. I stumbled on that. I began to publicize it as early as a year ago uh, in articles and lectures, audio tapes around the country. And I called it the Federal Reserve Plan of Healthcare. And by gosh, uh, uh, that started being picked up around the country. It never attributed to me, but that was all right. And it even appeared in the Washington Post, Lloyd Cutler, uh, one of the biggest propagandists in Washington, uh, actually uh, wrote an article about it called the Federal Reserve Plan of Healthcare. And uh, as I say, they, they had the original plan, which was identified by me and others as a Rockefeller plan. And so to save us from that terrible plan, you now have a Congressman Cooper in Congress who is offering an alternative plan, and not surprisingly, the alternative Cooper plan is the same as the Hillary plan. And uh, this is exactly the way they did it with the Federal Reserve, and they hope to do it again, but what they don't realize is that ploy has been exposed. It worked in 1913 because no one knew anything about it. The, the secret meeting at Jekyll Island, Georgia, uh, was not even mentioned until 1916, in an obscure magazine, and I dredged it up in 1948, 32 years later, and uh, that's the first time that anybody really had any knowledge of how this plan came to originate. So here they are doing it again with the health care reform plan, the secret meeting, the fake plan, which they know the people are going to reject. Uh, in fact, uh, they've already said that the health care reform plan, the, the Clinton plan, is now officially dead in Congress. And of course, Cooper is pushing very hard to get his bill in, and it is still the same monopoly plan. It has the universal health care, which of course there's no way they can fulfill, because uh, our present health care system, which is functioning, which is adequate, but in no way can it handle 27 or 38 million more people, whichever you want to believe, who are going to rush in and they all want kidney transplants and heart transplants. So, uh, <clears throat> and they know this, and the entire medical profession knows this, but, and also a feature of these plans is it is going to severely limit the amount of care given to people over 65 because we're going to come under a system called triage, and triage is where you have too much burden on the medical care system uh, with too few resources, so they have to make some hard decisions. Who are they going to treat and who are they going to let die? And of course, uh, it's right in the plan that the over 65 group, which I happen to be in, although I don't go much for medical treatment anyway, 
but uh, uh, they are going to be denied all of the new plans, all of the new medications, all of the new resources, because under this triage operation, those will be restricted to younger people. And the reason for that is, of course, the younger people are still paying taxes, and they're the ones that they want to keep working. And uh, they're, in other words, they're essentially writing off the over 65 group under the health care reform. And um, <laughs> amazingly enough, the American Association of Retired People, 22 million members in Washington, considered by some to be the most powerful lobby there, has carefully ignored these provisions in the health plan. Now, they may not have read it because it is 1,399 pages. The outline for this plan, which they took uh, some months to develop, they have, the mere outline was 290 pages. Then they finally sent a 1,399 page uh, plan to Congress, which I'm sure no congressman has read. And um, buried in all this are these uh, criminalization restrictions where you can be sent to prison for life, and they deny it's in there, but it's in there, and the Wall Street Journal has pointed out that it's in there. You can be sent to prison for life uh, if you give any false information to any health care provider, which would result in care being diverted from someone else who then dies. So in other words, they would say, you, you cause the death of that person, and for that you will get life in prison. Other penalties range $25,000 to $50,000, 10 to 15 years in prison. And I'm not talking about really serious stuff. This is for failing to provide enough information to the health maintenance organization, or failure to fill out all the forms that you were supposed to. And under this plan, anything that you fail to send in automatically is going to be considered a federal crime just as the income tax provisions became a federal crime. Even though under our law, our legal system, failure to repay a loan or a debt is not considered a crime. It's considered uh, something that has to be, uh, you have to be, uh, you either have to pay up or do something in order to clear this up, but it's not considered a crime. But under the Health Care Reform Act, uh, all these things will be a crime, but the real importance of the health care reform bill is that uh, it's going to give the bureaucracy and the world order a framework with which to proceed with many of their most uh, treasured goals, mainly gun control. Believe it or not, under the provisions of this health care reform plan, they will finally have the authority to confiscate the guns of the American people. And of course, it's the only way that they could do it. And I think it is really devilish that they came up with this plan because there was no way they could go before Congress and say, we're going to pass a bill and confiscate these guns. Now there is quite a movement in the country behind the scenes to get rid of Bill and Hillary one, one way or another. I was told in Washington at the National Press Club on January the 20th by people who really know what's going on that Clinton would be gone by April 1st. Well, that's tomorrow, and I don't think we're going to make it. Good try, but we, I don't guess we got there. But uh, the reason for this is that uh, the financial scandals and the sex scandals have ended Clinton's ability to get anything through Congress. He is totally stalemated. They want to get rid of him so bad. And um, I was told this in Washington. Uh, I said, well, is he going to be impeached? Will he resign? Will he be assassinated? And they said, uh, they don't care. Any way they can get rid of him, he's going to go. And uh, they'll have Gore there to do what they want to. And of course, Gore is a bureaucracy brat. He was raised in a hotel suite in Washington. His father was a senator. He never had a normal home life. And uh, the Gore family was on the payroll of Arm and Hammer for many years, the founder of the Communist Party of the United States. So uh, that tells you where Gore is coming from. That is why Gore became so prominent in the environmental movement. Now what happened? 
when communism no longer was a potent world force. It began to fall apart because the American people couldn't subsidize it any longer. We were broke, and so uh, communism collapsed simply because you Americans were no longer able to send your tax funds to Moscow to keep this system operating. It was as simple as that. It wasn't a matter of politics. It was a matter of money. And uh, as communism began to fall apart, they needed a new world issue to keep everybody in line. They came up with environmentalism. Environmentalism is the new communism. Now, of course, I'm against pollution. I don't drink uh, the tap water. I, don't, uh, I try to avoid a lot of the pollution, and I'm sure most of you do. But uh, environmentalism is not about controlling pollution. It's about carrying on the world order Marxist ideals through other means, through other means of control. And of course, that's why they have the little children in school uh, carrying banners and waving environmental slogans, just the way that the red pioneers, the Stalinist youth did in Russia during the heyday of communism. So when you see these things going on, you have to analyze them, see who is doing it, why they're doing it, and what are their goals. And the goals are there, but you have to look very carefully because, of course, they always present it as something else, just as they present health care as reform. Now, there's not a physician in the United States who does not know that there is no reform whatsoever in this bill. First of all, it's going to ration care, as I always mentioned, already mentioned the triage. Second, it's going to be more expensive because by the simplest analysis, when you load this enormous new bureaucracy onto the medical costs that we have right now, it's got to raise the cost by at least 30% without any new treatments being offered, but just the, the administrative costs and uh, the fact that they've criminalized it and they, they're going to have to have the, the Federal uh, Bureau of Investigation will have an enormous expansion because they're no longer going to chase the communists, which they never did anyway, uh, and they never chased the criminals because Meyer Lansky had those photographs of J. Edgar Hoover in uh, pink chiffon, which was totally wrong for his complexion. <laughs> and um, so uh, he was a joke as a crime fighter. And, but now the FBI is going to go after all of you people who don't fill out your health care reform papers the way you should. And believe me, they're going to be merciless. So you have that to look forward to. <clears throat> now the, um, the reason that uh, Hillary was the ideal person to uh, head this was, first of all, she was a corporate lawyer, and the health care reform bill is a corporation bill uh, sponsored by the big five insurance companies of New York, Aetna, Metropolitan, Prudential, and so forth, which are themselves merely extensions of the Federal Reserve System. Now, they're extensions of the Federal Reserve System because, like the income tax, they are part of the mechanism by which the uh, Federal Reserve bankers control the volume of, and flow of currency, the, the velocity of circulation. Because without these instruments, the whole thing would go totally out of control within a few weeks. But because the big five insurance companies have such enormous cash flow from the American people, you pay your premiums, and this cash flow is what keeps the whole system working, like the social security system is the same thing. The Fortune 500 corporations have lived off of the cash flow from social security since 1943. And uh, it's what keeps them functioning because a lot of times it's the only cash that they have is the uh, cash that they withhold from their workers' paychecks because most of them are losing money. General Motors, IBM, you've seen the figures, billions of dollars a year. And uh, the only thing they can count on is the withholding tax from their employees. So as I say, this is how they keep functioning. And uh, uh, so that's why they need this health care money uh, paid directly to them. It won't go to a physician, it won't go to a hospital, it'll go to these Federal Reserve bankers so that they can keep their system functioning. So uh, you might say it's your patriotic duty 
to uh, cooperate in health care reform so that we can keep the entire system from collapsing. Because it's always a house of cards, it's always on the point of collapse, and that's why this system, which is the Babylonian debt money system, which is 5,000 years old, which Jesus, Christ's ministry, uh, he preached against this, and it's still being inflicted on us because we simply did not pay enough attention to Jesus' words. We didn't honor him enough for going into the temple and turning over the money changers' tables. And that's why, unfortunately, the Christian ministry today is itself part of the Federal Reserve System, except for a few courageous preachers who generally are put in jail because uh, they simply refuse to go along with this Babylonian system, the cult of Baal. And um, so health care reform, as I say, is now the linchpin which will, they hope will help keep the whole system uh, together for a little bit longer. And these people, I will say, they have no real long-term program. They're operating really on a day-to-day -day basis, trying to, to uh, shore up this system for a little bit, keep it functioning a little longer so that we won't go the way of Russia, uh, which of course now is in hopeless chaos. And I don't see anything developing in Russia in the near future which will bring order out of this situation. And uh, we are very close to the same situation in this country where we will have uh, ethnic outbreaks, we will have racial outbreaks, we will have people against people, state against state, region against region, town against town. In other words, you will return to a feudal system. So, like it or not, the Federal Reserve System is all that we have to keep the whole system from degenerating into anarchy. Of course, I believe that it's so corrupt and so evil that that is preferable because under that you can begin a resolution of the situation, you can begin to rebuild, uh, otherwise you will simply go on with the total corruption that we have now. And in fact, uh, another extension of the Federal Reserve System is the tax-exempt foundation, which, as I have pointed out for a number of years, actually drafts all of the legislation passed by our state legislatures and by the Congress. And in fact, uh, in the Nation magazine, January 31st, 1994, this little Stalinist publication, they said what I've been saying for almost 50 years, says, ultimately, the American liberal agenda is settled by a small number of executives at foundations. And that's absolutely true. They make the agenda. But this agenda is given to them by the international bankers, by the Federal Reserve people, by the Rothschilds. They simply then put it in, they draft it into a usable form at the Brookings Institution, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation. It goes to Congress and they can discuss it and they can change it but uh, essentially it's what the uh, world order people want. Executives at these foundations, by the way, are a carefully selected group. I pointed out in the world order, which I first wrote in 1984, that they were brainwashed and controlled by an outfit in uh, London called the Tavistock Foundation, which grew out of a uh, group set up uh, by the British Department of Psychological Warfare after World War I uh, to make studies of shell-shocked soldiers to see how they could be controlled and brainwashed and perhaps restored to duty. From this, they decided, they developed such good brainwashing techniques, they decided this could be extended to the entire population. So Sigmund's, Sigmund Freud's uh, mentor, Princess Marie Bonaparte had uh, bought him a building in London after he, he had to leave Vienna. And uh, uh, this became the headquarters of the Tavistock Institute. And they set up uh, sensitizing programs which were exported to the United States. You had the Assailant Institute, you had the Rockefeller Foundation and other programs. Now, every executive at these tax-exempt foundations 
has to go through one of these Tavistock Institute brainwashing programs. And they have feely sex and they have everything you can imagine, nude sessions, probably drugs, and uh, of course Southern California became the mecca of many of these groups, but they're all over the United States. But the fact is all of our legislation is drafted by people who have been through the Tavistock Institute process. <laughs> and um, one of the important groups which handles all this is called the Institute for Policy Studies. Now we have a um, chart, this book was written by James Tyson, Target America, The, uh, the Influence of Communist Propaganda on U.S. Media, uh, published in 1981. He has here the table of organization of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union and its uh, agents in the United States, and it lists, of course, the National Lawyers Guild, Communist Party USA, and the Institute for Policy Studies. Now, the IPS, Institute for Policy Studies, was set up by a Russian immigrant named Samuel Rubin. Well, he decided to launch a line of cosmetics, but he didn't want to call it Rubin's Cosmetics. And being from Russia, the most famous name in Russia was called Fabergé. And of course, the Fabergé shops were confiscated by the communists. They were put out of business after the communist revolution. So the name was available. So Rubin called his uh, company Fabergé and they made many millions of dollars with their cosmetics in the United States. So with these millions of profits, he set up his own foundation uh, under his daughter, Cora, and her husband, Paul Weiss. And they called it the Institute for Policy Studies. And um, <laughs> one of the principal uh, agents of IPS is Hillary Clinton. She joined IPS when she was a student at Yale Law School. And um, now the FBI has issued extensive reports on IPS and the FBI reports that IPS personnel are linked to the pro-communist and anti-US group, uh, the Students for Democratic Society, the Weathermen Terrorist Group, which was involved in strategic sabotage, and the Progressive Labor Party, uh, which followed the Chinese Communist line in the United States. Now, one of the principal uh, advocates of IPS in this country, one of its officials, um, is a man named Derek Scherer, who happens to be one of Bill Clinton's closest advisors in the White House, although he does not uh, have any f official position. But Derek Shearer's sister married a time correspondent in Washington named Strobe Talbot. And Strobe Talbot is now Secretary of State in the Clinton administration. So you got another leader of IPS, his sister is uh, the wife of the Secretary of State at the present time. This shows you how important IPS is in our government in Washington. And uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, when she went to Yale, she became involved in a number of protest groups, but she soon found out that the real group was uh, <coughs> the uh, Institute for Policy Studies and the National uh, Lawyers Guild. Now, the National Lawyers Guild was identified as one of the leading communist fronts in the United States since 1938 by the House on American Activities Committee. Well, they found out that in 1987, Hillary Clinton donated $15,000 to the National Lawyers Guild, one of the biggest single contributions they ever had. And uh, so that shows how closely identified she is with IPS, because I haven't seen that she gave $15,000 to the Salvation Army or to the Red Cross, but she did give $15,000 to this notorious Communist Front. And uh, one of the principal beneficiaries of Hillary's gift of $15,000 was the lawyer William Kunstler, who has been the leading def uh, defender the official lawyer, really, for the Communist Party of the United States for many years. And in fact, whenever 
Um, a leading communist got into trouble uh, with the government. William Kunstler was the lawyer of choice. And the IPS chairman of the board, Peter Weiss, Samuel Rubin's son-in-law, uh, for years was a trustee of the National Lawyers Guild. The reason I mention all this is it's a, it's a very close connection here, and Hillary Clinton is right in the middle of all of it. And uh, at the same time, she is the person who has allowed her name to be used as the person who is putting this health care reform bill through in Washington. <coughs> now the, uh, and they're following the Federal Reserve pl plan right down the limit. And um, the fact is that, as the Wall Street Journal pointed out uh, in October of 12, that all national health insurance plans in all of the Western democracies are in an acute financial crisis. Universal coverage turns out to mean exploding costs. Now, of course, they know this. When they were uh, promoting Medicare uh, in Congress, which was then denounced as socialized medicine, uh, they gave very modest projections of what Medicare would cost, about one hundredth of what it's costing at the present time. And of course, the American Medical Association, the, the medical lobby in Washington, they assessed their members for many millions of dollars to fight Medicare, to fight socialized medicine, to save us from communism in our health care program. And what happened after it was finally passed, after all these millions of dollars had been spent in Washington, mostly on power lunches and limousines, uh, uh, Congress was never really affected by any of this lobbying because uh, they uh, had to listen to the people finally, and they did pass Medicare. So suddenly, the medical profession found that Medicare offered them a whole new opportunity for loot. In fact, the Washington Post pointed out a few weeks ago that the uh, <clears throat> amount of money being stolen each year uh, from the uh, Medicare system by the established hospitals and by the licensed doctors, not by alternative hair care practitioners or chiropractors, but by the medical establishment was stealing $700 million a year from Medicare, and that it would be much higher by 1995, next year. So I think that what they realized is this health care reform bill will give the medical profession unlimited license to steal that they can put in all of the fake uh, claims that they want. No one will bother them as long as they go along with the system. Uh, they can just about do whatever they want. <laughs> and the fact is that uh, much of our so-called health care today is itself uh, simply spending a lot of money without any real results. For instance, oncology, the treatment of cancer, for which the uh, bills mount enormously every year. And yet, uh, Dr. Hardin B. Jones, professor of medical physics at Berkeley, California, for, did a 25-year study on the lifespan of cancer patients, and he concluded that untreated patients do not die sooner than patients receiving orthodox surgery. Uh, that is, uh, surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, and that in many cases, they live longer. Now, he reported this uh, at the American Cancer Society 11th Science Writers Seminar, March 28th to April 2nd, 1969. 25 years ago, this medical authority stated that the untreated live longer. Well, of course, the American Cancer Society wasn't too happy about that. I don't think they ever invited him back. But uh, at least the information is there. All this information is here. And as I say, I started publicizing this fake new Federal Reserve System of Healthcare just about a year ago. And I, I researched it. I found out that the big five insurance companies and the Rockefellers were behind it. And that Senator Jay Rockefeller himself, the acting head of the family at the present time, had been commissioned to steer this thing through Congress using Hillary Clinton as a front runner. 
so that he would stay in the background. Well, after I began to publicize Jay Rockefeller, he came out of hiding and actually began to publicly espouse this bill. Uh, up to that time, he, and he even, even had his picture taken with Hillary Clinton. Up to that time, uh, he absolutely had nothing to do with it. He was staying out of sight, but I guess he decided, since he had been exposed, that uh, he definitely was going to go ahead and push and try to get it enacted. And uh, <coughs> the real author of the health care reform bill is a man named Alan Enthoven. And Alan Enthoven first surfaced as one of, of Robert McNamara's whiz kid brain trust at Ford Motor Company. They were going to rebuild the Ford Motor Company and make it a, a tremendous company in the tradition of the founder, Henry Ford. Well, these whiz kids, they, at that time, computers were just coming into use. They got on their computers, and on the computer, they drafted a model of the American of the car that all the American people wanted and that all the American people would buy. Uh, this car was the Edsel. <laughs> so uh, when this car came out, the American people refused to buy it. It used too much gas, it was too expensive, it wasn't what they wanted. And so uh, Robert McNamara and his brain trust packed up and left the Ford Motor Company and since the, there was no place they could go in private enterprise any longer, they headed for Washington. And Robert McNamara became Secretary of Defense. And as Assistant Secretary of Defense, he brought in his uh, protege, Alan Enthoven. And um, <clears throat> of course you know about the Vietnam War, that was McNamara's war. It didn't come out too well. It was another Edsel, I guess it was the first Edsel war we had. <laughs> because uh, it was a catastrophe and we finally gave up and came home, which uh, now has established a pattern. In fact, during all the years that we had a war department in Washington, we won every war that the Americans fought. Well, they changed the name to the Defense Department because we were no longer going to be aggressive. We were not going to indulge in wars of aggression. We were only going to uh, do defense, so they changed the name from the War Department so no one would have to worry about us declaring war on them. Uh, we were now the Department of Defense. Well, after they changed that name, we have never won a war since. And uh, we had the Korean War, Vietnam, now we're pulling out of Somalia, uh, Iraq. Well, you could say we won in Iraq, but that was never really a war. I mean, that was like sending the entire U.S. Army against a little patrol of Indians somewhere because uh, it, it wasn't a war at all. It was just a massacre. And of course, uh, we got some things out of that which we are still trying to f find out what happened. Uh, the American boys came home and uh, either they were the victims of chemical warfare by Saddam Hussein, which they began to hint, but now it seems, uh, according to this article in the Nation of uh, March 7th, 1994, it seems that the, our boys were poisoned by our own forces, by some of the chemicals we were using there, by some of the pesticides, and uh, they have one here called pyrodostigmine bromide, uh, which has been prescribed for some rare autoimmune dis diseases, involving faulty transmission of nerve impulses in the muscles. And uh, apparently, this can only be administered with careful monitoring, but uh, the, the Pentagon uh, was able to use this randomly in Iraq, and apparently this uh, pyrodostigmine is, bromide is the, is the real culprit in the mysterious illnesses affecting American personnel returning from uh, that area. But, of course, you're never going to read that anywhere except in little magazines like this. And um, meanwhile, the uh, prescription drug prices uh, have been increasing over the last 15 years at more than twice the national inflation rate with 400, and the prescription drug manufacturers have 400% uh, increase in earnings 
the highest profit margin in any major industry uh, at a time of this recession that we've just gone through. So apparently they're doing something right. And what they're doing right is they have the best lobbyist in Washington, a man who is now again in the news, Lloyd Cutler. And Lloyd Cutler is the biggest insider in Washington, the most powerful lobbyist, uh, head of the firm of Wilmer, Cutler, and Pickering. He represents the entire auto industry in Washington. He represents the entire pharmaceutical industry, the, the drug trust in Washington. And uh, this is why Clinton ran to get him, because he's the only person who can keep Bill and Hillary out of jail. And uh, that's the only reason that they appointed him uh, their White House counsel. And of course, he's not White House counsel at all. He's only there as a personal counsel for uh, Bill and Hillary, even though they're trying to say he will not advise them on any of their personal problems, only for the White House. Well, actually, the White House has no problems. So what would Lloyd Cutler have to do in Washington? And uh, the fact is that they hope that by getting Lloyd Cutler in, that he will save them from prison because there is $60 million missing from Madison Bank, and I don't have it and you don't have it, and uh, the Clintons are probably the only people who know where it is. And uh, so this is Lloyd Cutler's real job, is to try to pave over this situation and allow the Clintons to leave Washington gracefully without any prison time. <coughs> and uh, as I say, I was told he'd be out by April 1st, but now the new timetable is somewhere between now and November 1st. And whether you or I, I want them out of Washington is totally immaterial. The insiders have to get rid of them because the health care plan is totally uh, stalled, and this is so crucial. Without this plan getting through Congress and giving them this new bureaucracy, their whole program will be totally uh, derailed, and they cannot afford that, and that's why Clinton has to go, why he will go. And with Gore in there, they can hope to kind of get the thing going. Uh, she has become such a focus that they believe that if they can get her out of the way and get Bill out of the way, that uh, they can hopefully get this thing going again. <coughs> oh, <laughs> rolling right along here on our time. So um, the fact that Ezra Pound got me to write this Federal Reserve book in 19... 52 or 1949, I wrote it. It wasn't printed until 1952. Then I realized this was a very useful book for everybody. It was totally documented. All the research came from the Library of Congress. The chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee, Wright Patman, uh, stated, and I have the letter reproduced in the book, that this was the one book that he kept on his desk and the one book that he depended on. I realized that there was a real need for books of this type. And I, continued to write more books. I wrote The World Order, which documented the whole secret world government. I wrote uh, A Writ for Martyrs, which was intended as a legal brief for anyone involved in any problem with the federal government because it documented the crimes committed by federal agents uh, against individual citizens. And this book was printed in 1986, almost 10 years ago, and if, peop if it uh, could have reached a wider public, I think it would have prevented the federal agents from committing the atrocities at Ruby Ridge and the Waco Holocaust, because I stated in this book that these people had to be stopped. The fact that they had kept me under surveillance for 33 years, had harassed my family, had caused the deaths of my family from this harassment and intimidation, that something could have been done about it. Well, it wasn't, and that's why the Waco Holocaust occurred, because I had already sounded the alarm, and if it could have reached enough people, I think it could have been stopped. So even now, they are not uh, stopping. They they're want to uh, intensify their drive. They want to confiscate the guns. And uh, a gentleman asked me here today, he said, what about in your area up there in the Shenandoah Valley? Um, I said, he said, will that be a safe place to retire to? 
I said, yes, because everybody up there is armed to the teeth. If you don't have at least five shotguns, rifles, and pistols, you're practically naked. And uh, they are not people who are going to answer the door when two agents come and say, give us all your guns and put them in this bag. Uh, these people are going to be at the windows shooting just like they did with the Indians. And uh, uh, if there are two people in there, it's going to take 50 people to get them out and to get their guns. And so uh, that's why I, I stated in the World Order in 1984, People were always asking me, one of the first questions um, I, asked, I was asked at, at every meeting, and I always had a question and answer period, they would say, when are the communists going to take over? Right well, the fact that uh, every bureaucrat in Washington was a communist, it didn't seem to have gotten through to a lot of people. So I would tell them they will take over as soon as they get the 200 million guns in private hands in America. And not until then. They have no way. Of taking it. I don't care what legislation Congress passes, I don't care what the FBI or the BATF can do, they can go up and hit uh, one little man living alone at Ruby Ridge in Idaho, uh, but uh, there's no way that they can come up to Shondo Valley and get those truckloads of guns away from those people. In fact, they did pass this assault weapons uh, bill in California and I think they found that after five years, they had collected 13% of the assault weapons in the state of California. And that is with making it a real statewide program and trying to get everybody to cooperate. That's as far as they got. They probably will never get any further. And most of the people who turned in their guns probably will wish that they had them back at some point. But at any rate, as long as those guns are in private hands, and I'm informed today since 1984, the figure has grown from 200 million to 500 million because more and more people are arming themselves, and uh, which is an average of two weapons per person for every American citizen. And uh, I think that's probably true because there are a lot of people that have probably 25 or 50 stashed away. And uh, <laughs> even in my little sleepy southern town, up there in Stanton. Uh, I have a loaded 38 under my pillow because I live alone. And I had two fellows knock on my back door recently and um, after dark and no one ever comes to my back door. And uh, so um, one of them mumbled something and I put my ear to the door and he said something like, is John here? And I said, what? And so I ran upstairs and got my pistol and came back and I said, will you fellas please stand aside because I'm going to shoot through the door and I don't want blood all over my porch. <laughs> well, they left. And uh, I'm sure they knew I lived alone, elderly person, that uh, they figured I would open the door to see what this fellow was trying to tell me and then that would be the end of me. Uh, so uh, this is the situation that we have. And I don't consider it anarchy, I consider it just the good old American frontier, we're here, and the savages are here, and uh, you just want to survive. In fact, hopefully, we want to civilize the country eventually. And maybe we can start that right here, by this meeting here in a very historic area. Uh, it could be the turning point that will start taking the country back. And uh, I feel, almost every day, I feel more optimistic about the way things are going. This started to happen, believe it or not, during the campaign of 1992, when the American people looked at Bill Clinton and they looked at George Bush, the skull and bones man, and they said, my God, we don't want either one of these bums. And that created an opportunity for a guy named Ross Perot to come forth, offering nothing, really saying nothing. Whenever they asked him, what is this program? He'd say, well, I'll tell you later. And still, everybody said, this guy is wonderful, which he was compared to these two rascals that were looking for the presidency. And uh, so that showed me at that time that the American people all over the country, not just in some little county or some little town, they're ready for a change. They want big changes, which is what I like. I like big changes. Let's go for it. And uh, I really think this is the most exciting time in American history. I look forward to the next three to five years as probably being the most interesting period in American history since 1776. 
And on that note, I'll say good night, and I thank you very much. <laughs>